Welcome to my video. This is David Poe. And today we're working on a 11 by 14 canvas board. My colors are titanium white, Hansa yellow light, uh, pyrrole red, ultramarine blue, and then burnt umber. So a very limited palette, but we will get maximum color out of this. And uh, the medium I'm using is a uh, Cobra uh, quick dry medium. And so all of the colors today are water mixable oils. So if you ever wanted to explore or find out about water mixable oils, um, this might be a video that you will want to watch. I am just experimenting with them at this point. I don't find much difference between using these and regular oils, if you were concerned about that. And I really like the fact that um, I'm eliminating the mineral spirits from my studio by using these water mixable oils. They, they're made by Royal Talons, and uh, once again, that company that makes all of these colors I'm using today it, uh, is Royal Talons, and the, uh, the line or the brand is uh, Cobra. And I'm using the professional brand. They do have a student brand, but I would not recommend that. All right, so we're beginning with the sketch. Got a photo reference today, as well as a, a plein air study that I've done uh, numerous times. And so I'm just taking some burnt umber on uh, number two flat uh, Aspen uh, brush by Princeton. And of course, this is just kind of a map for me. Where are some of the big shapes going to go on the canvas? A reminder that when you are painting, that's really all you need. You do not need to worry so much about detail. As I've mentioned in my other videos, a lot of the painting process looks ugly to me. When I was a beginner, I was very discouraged by what my painting looked like at the very beginning of the process. And you just have to get used to the uncomfortableness of it. You will hear that little voice inside your head like I did. Oh, you can't do this. This doesn't look good. Oh, you're never going to be able to, to produce artwork that others are going to find beautiful or satisfying or colorful. Uh, you got to fight through that. It's kind of like anything in life, right? There's always going to be folks that are naysayers telling you that you cannot do something, that you're not good enough, and you have to fight through that. You will find that over time, if you continue to keep painting, you will get better. One of the reasons I started doing these videos is to hopefully show you that, because I, I still do not consider myself to be a great painter, by any stretch of the imagination, I'm still learning in the process. And sometimes it's actually easier to learn from someone that's closer to your talent level than uh, many of the pros that produce the um, very good painting videos that you might spend hundreds of dollars on. Uh, this is free, so I don't think you can complain too much here on YouTube. If you do like these videos, by the way, you would really help me out immensely. If you could give a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and uh, if you are so inclined, even share this video feed with uh, folks through Facebook and Instagram and your other social media so that other folks that might be interested could watch, especially if they're interested in learning how to paint or have any desire at all. Uh, I also know a lot of folks, even before I began painting, who find it uh, uh, very helpful for relaxation and lowering your stress and anxiety level to, to watch painting videos because it alleviates uh, thinking a lot about some of those problems, right? And, uh, and the whole hobby itself, I think, is very helpful. If you have trouble with anxiety, if you have insomnia, <laughs> uh, you may want to watch some painting videos and, and you may discover that this is uh, kind of a meditation, if you will, 
to get your mind off of some of that stress. And especially, uh, I would encourage you if you find that it is uh, helpful for your anxiety levels and relaxation and combating insomnia, that uh, you may want to pick up the hobby and actually, instead of just watching these videos, uh, get a little paint set and begin painting your own works. Well, here the sketch is done in, in burnt umber, as you can tell. Uh, like I said, it's just a road map. Now, this is a combination of ultramarine blue and a little bit of Hansa yellow light. Of course, we're using a very minimum palette today, so there's only one primary of each of the colors, which can really simplify and make things work well for you. If you're a beginner, I would really recommend that you start off with just a few colors, and you will be surprised at how you'll begin to learn how to mix your own greens, your own other um, you know, purples and your own oranges, and you will, uh, that will really help your, your overall goals in terms of becoming a much better painter if you limit the palette. It's very tempting to go to the art stores today and pick up any color under the rainbow, right? But it also costs you a lot more money, and it's really not necessary. Uh, there will always be paint manufacturers trying to sell you exotic colors and uh, you need to just remember that you can pretty much create anything under the sun with the primary colors so if you are doing plain air sometimes i will cho choose a kind of color temperature palette which might include um you know uh, a cool yellow and a warm yellow uh, a cool red, a warm a red, a, a cool blue and a warm blue, uh, plus titanium white, and, and oftentimes I, I may add uh, one earth tone, which would be like a, a burnt umber or maybe a burnt sienna. And that's really all the colors that you need. So keep in mind that uh, also that when you limit the colors, you will help your color harmony. And color harmony deals with, if you're using a very limited palette, when you're mixing your colors, you're, you're using all the colors basically in different ratios for your mixtures. And so it produces its own natural color harmony by the time that you're done. All right, so here I'm mixing some of that pyrrole red, uh, and it's the bright red. I, and uh, let's see, what am I putting in there? Okay, so I'm mixing some, some Hansa yellow light, and now I'm going back in there with some ultramarine blue. Notice too, as, as I'm mixing with the pool of color on my wooden palette here, that um, if you pull the bristles through the paint rather than push them through, your brushes will last a lot longer. It ruins a brush if you try to push too much uh, in a different direction. You wanna you wanna maintain those those bristles and their form as long as possible. And it's also good, like I'm doing here for a minute, to to make sure as you mix the colors on your palette. Uh, get the values straight on your palette before uh, putting them on your, your canvas. It really will help you out immensely to spend more time on the palette uh, with your mixtures uh, than actually putting paint on the board. Here I'm, I've mixed up, this is going to be a colorful scene, I'm kind of painting the, the wetlands, I think. And so uh, this is kind of a reddish, reddish brown, if you will. And uh, varying the the brush strokes. Also, when you're doing the darks, and I always start with the darks, so that's why there's the dark green that I showed you, and now this dark orange, orange brown, is that it, it this these will go on thinner. Uh, this is the the initial lay in or block in, as some artists call it, of the big shapes. So notice again, I've got that mountain form so far painted in with the the dark green and now with this brownish orange I'm painting in some of the shapes of the trees there's just a couple of trees there uh, once again maybe I, I covered this in the other video but 
you want to use, if you're going to have like a group of trees or a group of bushes or some kind, you want to make sure that it's an odd number. For whatever reason, our brains, when we have even numbers, it's distracting. And so we can learn from artists that have gone before us that if you're going to paint trees, paint other images, even even wildlife, uh, it, it may be best to, to have odd numbered things in your paintings, whether that's one, three, five, what have you. All right, and so, so I'm just blocking in at this point, and colors have to be in relationship to the other colors on the palette. So one of the things I really highly recommend is that you don't have to waste too much of your time trying to get the paint the exact color that you're wanting. Sometimes it's good to just kind of go for a middle tone of the value or close to the tone that you want. And then there'll be plenty of time after you have the initial lay-in with the shapes and the color to go back in. And then you're going to, to mix in a little bit more paint. You, that's when, um, uh, you know, right now in the initial block and I will often use a little bit of water to get that, uh, since these are water mixable oils, to get the paint flowing. Um, and I want it very thin, so that way I can come in with thicker paint with a little bit more uh, medium. Uh, right now I'm not using any uh, of the uh, Cobra uh, fast dry medium, but I will switch to that after the canvas is all covered with these in initial tones. And oftentimes what I found difficult when I was a beginner was that I would start with these color mixtures too light and realize that it's better to actually start too dark because it's easier to lay lighter colors on top of the dark colors. It, it, it doesn't sound very, it, it almost sounds wrong when you say that, right? It seems like, well, don't you start with lighter colors because darker colors are going to cover it? Well, um, not with this medium, not, not when you're using oils. Um, and, and remembering to paint in light uh, uh, light layers. Uh, you, you can actually go in over top of these with lighter shades, as I'll show and demonstrate in this, this painting video, and uh, you would be amazed at the, at the color you end up getting and uh, how, how there's some of that texture comes through. The, these colors begin to kind of blend together as you are looking at the painting. So here's a little bit more of a yellow mixture with, uh, of course, there's only a couple choices here when you're making colors with a very limited palette. So that's Hansa Yellow Light. And then um, some ultramarine blue as well as some pyrrole red uh, mixed into this mixture. And you can just barely see the shift of colors from where the sun is hitting on, on this uh, group of trees. And so I'm just laying this in, vary, varying my brush strokes at this point, and uh, getting the basic shape in. Even here, I'm not... Not worrying about detail. I'm not trying to make this look like a tree yet. As you, as you notice, this this almost looks comical, right? So once again, this is the the part where I continue to tell you, you have to paint ugly before it makes sense. And by that, I mean the sketch is not going to be perfect. It's going to look rather ugly. It's just a map to telling you where the big shapes are. You're, you're initially blocking in as quickly as possible to cover the entire canvas with paint. This needs to be light, and you're, you're just going for the big shapes. There's a, a grouping of trees behind here. I have mixed in a little bit of titanium white now with that yellow mixture that was already on my palette. That's another good thing to remember is to use the pulls of color on your palette to help you judge the value. And of course, if you want objects to sit back further in the painting one way that you do that is by lightening that mixture and oftentimes temperature wise you're making it colder uh, and by that i mean uh, more blues more uh, the the warmer colors which are going to be the yellow and the red um, those those will pop up or or closer to you in the foreground area because as as distance as you look into the distance those colors are the ones that drop off the quickest the yellows and the reds and then 
uh, lasts the blues. And of course, titanium white is also a cold color. Uh, remember that when you're painting your skies. We'll get to that in, the, in a minute. So do you see with the yellows that that kind of um, creamy yellow that I put on the, um, the grouping of trees in the background there close to the, the green mountain, if you will, uh, it makes it sit back some. Now, is it a perfect shade as I look at this video and do the voiceover today? No, it, it certainly isn't. Um, and I will adjust that later. Right now, I don't have to worry about that too much because guess what? Until I get all the thing, all the all the shapes colored um, and blocked in, I still won't know exactly what what change I need to make. So there's no point in changing it right now. There's no point in wasting that time. You just want to go as quick as you can in filling in the big shapes. So we got the tree groups in front. We got a little tree group in the back. We've got um, this mountain. We've got the sky above that I haven't addressed yet. We've got the land masses as well as this uh, water feature that is going to be prominent up front. I will say with these water mixable oils, uh, I know that a lot of people don't like them. <laughs> um, my experience so far has been that they seem to hold up just like the, the oils. So I have not really noticed much of a difference. And, and you can manipulate these in ways that you wish. You could use water mixable oils and remember that you don't have to paint like some kind of a watercolorist with a bunch of water in your mixtures. Basically, for the most part, I'm, I'm just using a little bit of water to get the paint to flow. But other than that, I'm just painting it as if it was just regular oil, regular oil paint. Here again, I'm using the mixtures that are already on the palette to judge my colors, uh, mixing on the palette before I apply it to the painting itself in these groups. And uh, for this uh, ground plane, I'm noting that as the colors come towards the viewer, towards me, that uh, they become a little darker, more of a variety in terms of the colors. And so right now, I'm just kind of laying in the ground, if you will, right? And ground's always usually a brown. This is a mixture of some, some uh, Hansa yellow, uh, ultramarine blue, and even the um, pyrrole red. Uh, I believe that's the colors I was using for this part of the ground. I'll come back in with some burnt umber later on to, to do some, some darker highlights on this ground plane. Also changing the um, drawing just just ever so slightly at this point. I'm going to extend some of this uh, ground plane shore and turn it into kind of a, a little bit of a wetland in which, uh, you know, there's a little pulling of, of water in the ground. It, it's not uh, easy to distinguish the shoreline necessarily because you've got places where the water is clearly coming over the land and, and the land is encroaching upon the, the water uh, feature of this landscape. So that's what we're working with. Uh, and here's where the burnt umber is being introduced. I know right now you can only see my arm. <laughs> Maybe one day I'll figure out how to really paint and do videos at the same time. Here, I'm just adding some of the darker features of that ground using that burnt umber pretty much straight out of the tube with just a little bit of uh, water uh, to help it flow a little bit. One, one thing I will say about the Royal Talons version of the water mixable oils, um, and the same would go for their regular oils, which are Rembrandt, they have a nice flow to them. They're not stiff paints and... For me, at least, I don't really like the, the stiff paints. Uh, Old Holland tends to be stiff, for an example. And I, I find those difficult to use. Though they're highly pigmented, which is good, but you do have to use quite a bit of medium with those. And sometimes that can be a problem, because especially if you're doing um, 
by layers, you have to always remember it's lean over fat, remember? Uh, lean being less oil in the first initial um, paint layers, and then you can add some more of the medium into your paints as you're painting over top of those layers. I really enjoy painting a la prima, which means that I paint all at once. So you'll see me paint as quickly as I can and cover the canvas and, and finish the painting in one sitting. I don't come back and do much to it after I worked on it for time in my studio or in plain air. And that's primarily why I do it is, is that um, I spend a lot of time plain air painting uh, studies. And by practicing that, you get used to the lights always changing. You have to paint quickly. And so you keep you keep moving, and um, usually now some some of the great artists did go back to the same scene, trying to uh, paint over several days when the the weather was in light condition to to get all of those layers in, but that's not how I paint. I I tend to if I'm going to go out and paint, or even in the studio. I enjoy just getting all the layers down as quickly as possible, a la prima, and then not trying to go back and touch up a painting that I did, you know, a week ago or something. And one of the things I find helpful is not doing that because the tendency, if you try to go back and, and finish a painting, is that you end up concentrating too much on detail. You can labor over the painting. And then it doesn't have the sense of looseness and confidence in the brush strokes because you're kind of noodling every little mark, trying to make it perfect. And and really, you, you can't you can't make a painting perfect. You can't uh, you really can't paint a tree. You can't paint a mountain. All you're trying to do is is uh, paint the shapes. And if you learn how to do that, to, to see like a painter and paint the shapes rather than think, okay, I'm painting a tree. Okay, this is a house. Um, that really causes you to tense up and, and oftentimes make it less lifelike than if you were only thinking of it as an a abstract uh, shape, whether that be if you're painting a person or painting a landscape or some kind of an object. And uh, most of the time, um, I agree with other artists that talk about the fact that you need to remind yourself, we're not really painting things. We're painting effects. How the light is reflecting off of these objects. How, how the weather is affecting the values of the colors we're seeing. And uh, the best time to paint, if, you're, if you go outdoors and paint, by the way, is early in the morning and um, and in the evening right before dusk. So s sun up to, to about 10 in the morning at, at various places and around the world, depending on where you live. Uh, and then, um, you know, from, from about 10 a.m. until until about uh, 3, 30, 4 o'clock, you, you probably don't want to be painting during that time. You want to you wanna wait when um, there's shadows and more going on with the effects of light. Now for absolute beginners you might want to paint when the light's not going to change much and you're going to have similar effects for numerous hours and not worry too much about uh, the shadows and, and those kind of effects yet but get used to just uh, learning how to paint faster learning how to look at uh, the block and stage of the larger shapes so all right, so let's look at this painting as it's beginning to emerge. I put some sky holes with a little bit darker shade of blue that we find in the sky uh, at various locations. Uh, I'm not real happy with that right now, but I don't have to be. I, I remind myself I'm going to go over this again. Now I'm uh, making up a mixture for the clouds. I'm going to put just a few clouds in this sky. The sky is not really the focus here. Just a little touch of Hansa yellow light in with the titanium white and why do I do that to uh, to uh, warm up the color if you only use titanium white for your clouds every scene that you paint is going to feel like it's winter because titanium white is such a cold color 
So you need to warm that up to give the sense that uh, the cloud uh, is, is not in the dead of winter. <laughs> And now I'm applying that to the space that I had uh, left bare on the canvas in between two shades of blue to give a little bit of variety to the sky. Uh, I'm one that always favors putting a little bit of atmosphere into the sky, even if it's not there. I tend to think of uh, just plain blue skies as being rather boring. And many, and when you look at the the artwork of a lot of of the classically trained um, landscape painters you will notice that a lot of them also have very dramatic skies uh, most likely made up <laughs> from their imagination even if they were painting in plain air or outdoors now i'm applying some of that darker blue that's in the sky um, i've darkened it just a little bit more than what the sky has and now i'm putting it into the water element. Now, oftentimes I will paint the water in a vertical manner, not horizontal, but here today I've changed my mind and gone more horizontal with these strokes. And I think it'll become more evident as we move forward in the painting why well, I think that sort of works here. And notice, I'm almost done with the block end. Almost all the colors on it. So now as I paint closer to the foreground, the colors get darker, right? Because you get the full assortment up close. All the reds, all the yellows, all the blues are open to our use. And more detail, because as objects are a little closer to us, they take on a little bit more detail. We, we see more detail. And so now I'm mimicking as best I can some of the shadowed areas of the water feature that I'm using as the reference. I am using flat brushes. These are synthetic flat brushes. I use a limited number sizes uh, they're all flats sizes two four six and eight for my 11 by 14 works when you go up in size you may want bigger brushes of course i also use a rigger brush the set i'm working with today consists of uh, one rigger i believe it's a size two they're all from princeton the aspen line and then of course the flats two four six and eight There I go, uh, just taking some a darker shade to indicate that as we come closer to the viewer, you're seeing less of the light and the sky being reflected into the water. Uh, just think of yourself standing at a shore and oftentimes, at least like on a river, the, the water that's closer to the bank looks darker than when you look across the expanse of the the river or the pond and the light that's being reflected off of it farther away from you tends to look bluer um, than than the water near you the water near you on a lot of lakes and rivers especially here in the united states take on kind of a green tint to them all right, so now the whole canvas is covered, and now I'm going back in and basically painting on, on the canvas. I've, I've laid in these colors, but I want to soften my edges. This is the primary goal with this. Uh, soft edges allow the viewer some space. Uh, when you see hard edge, edges, you're, you're basically giving directions. Hey, look here. And so... I don't want the focus to be on the clouds. I, I want them to have a sort of soft feel, more realistic feel in, in that area of the painting. Of course, the higher up in the sky, the more blue you actually see. 
And so that's why you notice that there's a, t a, vo uh, a change in the color tone there uh, towards the top of the painting. And it gets to be a lighter blue as we get closer to the horizon line. And then I'm painting into a little bit of the shapes of the trees, uh, the fall tree colors there, the reds and the burnt browns and the yellows. And then I'm kind of going to work my way forward towards the viewer in the painting now. So I begin at the sky level after I blocked in. I'm refining my shapes. I'm refining the colors at the same time. And I'm also, by the way, applying thicker paint as I'm doing this. And it makes sense, right? Because the colors are going to be lighter now. And I want them to be bolder because of that fact. And also because I want those colors to cover up some of the block in that I just put down. Here I'm refining and, and uh, looking at those edges on the trees or the tree shapes at this point to make sure I don't have any hard lines that are distracting to the viewer. Same way, excuse me, same way on the mountains. I'm uh, taking away some of the hard edges here. Especially near the edge of the painting, because I certainly don't want people viewing the painting and feeling tempted by the lines to go over and see who else's paintings next to me on either side of the painting. Here, just adjusting some of the shape of this uh, mountain that stands kind of behind these tree groupings. I'm gonna I'm gonna get I'm gonna change that eventually. By the way. <laughs> I started with a dark green. Um, it could have worked like this as I'm looking at this painting. The, the yellows and the reds and the greens look good. But I kind of want to push that mountain area back further so that I can get the color purple into this painting. I tend to be in a, what you might call an impressionist. I'm very interested in color relationships. I'm not as interested in getting the shapes exactly accurate. I'm not trying to be photorealistic. I'm trying to give you an impression. And also a reminder that as we look at things, we can only focus on one small area of a scene at a time. And so we, we do see things sort of blurred around the edges. And so... Uh, I believe the Impressionists had a really interesting way of seeing the world. And I try to use some of those techniques from the Impressionist to, to capture that sense of here's colors, but no details, and yet also have a sort of a focal point where there will be more details that kind of stand out from everything else to give your eye one spot to be directed towards to see as sort of the subject matter or the story that I'm telling in the painting. And I would uh, recommend that you do that as well. Most artists will tell you every painting should have a focal point. Where is the artist directing you to look? And we can do that with lines, with soft edges, with detail, with color. Sometimes not always all in the same painting but but you will you will definitely see in many paintings that the author of that piece is wanting you to enter the painting from a certain direction wants you to look at a particular object or a, more often than not an effect of the light on an object so now i've uh, decided now that i've that we're continuing to move down from the top to the bottom as we come forward towards the video, uh, towards the viewer. And now I've mixed up a shade of purple that is about the same value as the green and placing it on the top of these mountains. So now I've created a sort of 
additional level of uh, trees with that dark green. And at the same time, playing off of the color purple and these oranges that are right next to it. That helps those trees to pop even more, I think, if you noticed what they look like next to the, all that green. And now with uh, the addition of these uh, purple mountains. And now I'm just, once again, kind of refining the shape. Just giving you the impression that this is a tree. And trying to vary the size of these shapes so that um, it's more believable. If, if our masses look a lot alike, like kind of a cookie cutter approach, it doesn't lend itself well to believability, right? So we have to kind of work hard at not repeating certain shapes and allowing ourselves to, to um, come up with unique brush strokes, etc. I'm pretty happy right now with the shapes that, that are emerging. The painting is not done by any means, but once again, notice it, it is a rather ugly painting at this point. That If someone came along and saw me painting this outside or in a studio, and they might have the impression that, oh, poor guy, he, he doesn't know how to paint. That doesn't look like a tree. It's just kind of these blobs of masses uh, you know, my, my kid would come home with, with something from kindergarten that looks similar to this. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, well, like I said, you have to work through this to realize that, yes, you know what? Until you get all the paint on there, it's not going to look like a finished painting, nor should it. And if you make each level look too realistic, uh, I believe you're not going to be very satisfied with the end product. I think uh, paintings that are attempting to be like photographs are kind of a waste of time. You can just take a photograph if that's what you want. Now, some of that artwork looks pretty doggone impressive when artists paint realistically. But for me, I want to stretch the imagination. I want to see a scene in a painterly way and communicate to you the effects of light that I experienced. Uh, I want to draw your attention to certain aspects of a scene. I want to see how far color harmony gets us in terms of delight. And so I'm much more interested in color values next to one another and relationships, composition, rather than all kinds of detail. And now notice I, I am making these mixtures a little bit lighter in terms of the color or value and then placing them on the darker colors that I've already established now as we move forward making a mixture of yellow now with Hansa yellow light predominantly and a little bit of titanium white to add some highlights onto this particular tree unit or group of trees. Trying to make sure that this yellow has more yellow in it so that will help it stand and come forward from the yellow mass of trees you see behind it. That, that small kind of blob, if you will, <laughs> near, near that uh, purple mountain, right? And here I go. I'm just trying to vary the, the brush strokes to give the illusion of, of trees and leaves on the, on the tree right now. I will say one, one thing I may not have done on this painting is later on I'm going to come back in and work on these edges and 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 as I look at this I may have just needed to leave these shapes alone. There's a great temptation for all of us to kind of do too much blending of our color masses as as we're trying to be attentive to the lines and, and reducing the number of lines, softening the edges. Sometimes what we end up doing is obliterating the other colors. 
and not allowing enough contrast in our paintings. Contrast usually brings about more interesting paintings. People are drawn to the contrasting colors. Here, once again, I, I think that those the, these shapes right now probably could have been left alone, but you'll notice that when I come back in, I soften some of those areas, which may have been a mistake. This is one reason why if you're even starting, uh, you may actually want to videotape some of your paintings as you take up the hobby. Because as you play it back, as you remember the process and various stages of painting, you will become more acquainted with your style, what you like, what you dislike, and you may also pick up on some bad habits that you may currently be doing or ways in which you kind of are your own worst enemy for adding too much detail or getting too bogged down in some of the uh, colors and shapes and such. Uh, here I've mixed up a little bit of the pyro red with a little bit of titanium white so that it would be the same tonal value as the yellow highlights that I put on the other tree. Does that make sense? If, if you squint, you can see how this particular shade of, of salmon, if you will, or a kind of a pinkish red, is very close actually to that yellow that's on the tree. When you squint, you can't really make out where one ends and one begins, which is, which is the desire here. I'm also now conscious of a few things as I'm painting this other tree unit that uh, the red in the corner, it's about the only red I haven't obliterated with this lighter shade. And so it sticks out like a sore thumb right now. Do you see it at the corner? And basically takes you right off of that corner. Um, I, not to see another painting, obviously, but uh, just to kind of look there, and it's awkward. And uh, we're in charge of the painting, and so if we want our audience to look at a certain place, we have various uh, techniques to do that. We can uh, put more detail in one spot of the painting than another to draw the viewer in more to that specific spot. We can uh, use uh, various brush strokes to give some emphasis, some texture even, to the paint itself, which can also be equally effective at getting other people to notice our artwork. Further refining the shapes now, going in with some darker greens now. So we laid our earth uh, tones on that, uh, on the foreground. And now I wanted to establish a little bit of a line because that's how I was seeing and perceiving it onto the shore. It also helps bring the uh, author I'm sorry, the, the viewer in, into the painting by, by following the lines and following the darker mass of colors that's up here in front of these trees. And we'll further, I'll further refine some of these shapes as we move along in the painting today. darker green here but I will come along with a lighter green to like I did with the trees and the mountain to come in and, and paint over top of some of that and there are various times in which as you work on a painting you're going to change your mind you're going to have doubts about your composition, about your color choices, your tonal values. Remember, it takes time. Not every picture that you make is going to be a masterpiece. It may surprise you, but there have been some videos that I've made of paintings, and the paintings did not turn out well. And so the video consequently never was released because they were paintings I gave away um, 
sold cheaply on eBay <laughs> or, or, or burned them in the, in the dump. <laughs> so we, we all have paintings like that. I've, I've heard many artists say that they, you should not show everything that you've made. Only show the best. Well, <laughs> I tend to think that that could lead you to perfectionism. And sometimes when you try to be perfect, you may be throwing away and burning works that you shouldn't be because maybe they're, maybe they're excellent. And uh, you can easily fall victim to the kind of artist eye in which everything you make seems not as good as somebody else's work. So keep that in mind. Uh, once again, I noticed that that uh, little corner is a little too red for me up on that one tree. So uh, I think later on in the video, you'll see me uh, pull that out again with, with some orange colors. And I've noticed that there really is a salmon color there. And eventually I'm going to put go back in and put more of an orange in between those two colors. Here I'm trying to, to give some variety to those strokes in the, in the grass. When you have grass kind of poking up in various places, you get some different colors moving in between it, a sense of motion. So that's kind of what I'm going for right now is, is mixing some of that into the darker greens, laying it on, in on top of the greens, trying not to do too much to mess with it. Like I, I must admit that um, as you saw me kind of... Uh, smash in the the yellow highlights and and the light red highlights in those two trees i'm not sure that it it improved anything it, it may have hurt the painting uh, when i did that honestly i i think i overcome it with some of the other strokes that i will put in later but i could have easily left it alone and it may have served as even more of a focal point uh, with some stronger color variations in mind. Here I'm working on the water element. So this could be a little pond, uh, maybe maybe the edge of a lake. Put in some phalo blue. No, I'm sorry, that's not phalo blue. That's ultramarine blue. And a little bit more Hansi yellow to, to give it a kind of an aqua shade, a little darker aqua shade which you would expect to find in a water element. Very rarely do you see pools of water of any, of any kind that, that really are reflecting the exact color of the sky. Uh, so keep that in mind. Although lots of people really love to see blue water, even if blue water is rather elusive. And now I'm putting in some little bit of purple in the water close to the shoreline. I think you can see that. Why would I do that? Well, I that big space of purple in the back needs that color repeated somewhere else in the painting. The same way with uh, some of the reds that you see right now. They need to be repeated in some way in other parts of the painting so that we kind of create a visual harmony in the painting. Here I'm now varying those darker greens and going over top with a lighter green mixture just to, to give the sense of some variety in the vegetation that's closer to the video to the viewer. It has, excuse me, it also has the same tonal value as those yellow highlights and the red salmon type highlights that you already see in this foreground. There especially you can see it. Notice how quickly I'm now working just to get some of that color into those larger shapes. Others are of uh, are, are of course doing the same thing here. Yeah. 
even now, I would say that the painting is, is just, it's not done quite yet, is it? And people coming up might might suspect that it, it looks better, but it's not quite there. It's still got some ugly sections, if you ask me. Here I'm trying to to get that shoreline pretty straight on the painting. When uh, the waterline needs to be as straight and accurate as you can, because otherwise, if it's tilted slightly, it just seems to throw everything else off. And then viewers of your paintings are uh, going to be distracted by that. Here I'm putting some more of those uh, blue highlights into the water to suggest the water's movement. Now we're going to start with the details. So the focal point is going to be these these uh, this group of trees here. So I'm, I'm reasonably happy now with the water element with the hills in the background, the purple mountains, if you will, and the sky with some of the blue colors it introduces and the greens in the foreground. And so now I'm going to basically turn these into aspen trees with the white bark. So this is actually a mixture of titanium white and a little bit of the burnt umber. You may only see white on your screen as you look at this, but but uh, let me let me tell you that that is not pure titanium white. If it was, it would stick out like a sore th thumb, and and I don't think be very visually attractive. So this is actually a mixture of titanium white and some Hansa light yellow. And uh, I think it might also contain, yes, it does. It contains a little bit of the burnt umber as well. And now I'm taking the rigger brush. This is the number two rigger, uh, Princeton Aspen line, uh, synthetic bristle, and pulling up the tree branches. So my suggestion on how you paint trees is that you that you start from the bottom of the tree, press hard, lighten up on the press as you move that, that stroke upwards, and then repeat. And that's what I'm doing. And notice that as the paint is brought upwards, I get a little bit lighter in my touch so that we see that the the tree branches at the top are not the same exact size as the ones below. And keep in mind that if you're going to paint trees, one of the ways that you make them look more real life, if you will, or, or even uh, impressionistic, is that you've got to, to take the time to paint a lot of brush work. Uh, into those tree roots, the different limbs of the tree. Those all sort of need to be given attention. And also notice that all branches don't go one way. They don't just all go up. Uh, some grow out towards the light from the sides of the tree, the bottom of the tree. Almost any part of the tree is growing and has its own kind of character to it. So when I'm doing this, I'm not copying necessarily a particular tree. There's no photo of this tree anywhere. What I am doing is trying to emulate what I see in most trees. And now, um, I looked at these aspens, but I also want a couple of highlights with some darker, darker branches, which I think are going to set off the aspens a little bit. And so this is just pretty much straight burnt umber. And the same technique for producing the tree branches is, is starting strong at the bottom, 
allowing the paint to work itself off of the brush as I move the brush upwards from the end of the brush and then uh, cleaning the the um, the rigger after that work is done and once again like I said uh, adding more little branches and being careful not to put too much paint on them and to to get a sense that uh, these branches are constantly appearing and reappearing as they kind of work their way through this network. Because ultimately, uh, many of these brushes have tons of different uh, ex extenders, if you will, uh, of these branches going every which direction. They, they've got, they're full of color that, that as the leaves change and fall to the ground, at least in the Midwest. We've got a lot of changing color in the landscape, which is helpful to our painting processes. Here, I'm once again putting up a few of the darker uh, trees. Uh, this particular one I'm painting now doesn't, it's kind of more of a dead tree. It's, it's not meant to have a bunch of um, branches or leaves onto it. We're just kind of suggesting its growth at this point. And I'm rather happy with that feature because as I'm pulling it through the white tree branches, I love the contrast of the two colors. This, this wonderful kind of warm titanium white for some of these aspen trees, um, juxtapositioned by these, these darker branches of burnt umber. Now, as we get closer and closer to the viewer, there's more shrubbery, more uh, branches, vegetation. And so I'm taking my rigger brush now, loading it with the burnt umber and allowing my hand to manipulate the brush from the bottom to just give a variety of different strokes. And uh, sometimes I might move it, the brush itself, and I, I'm flipping it as, as I'm coming into contact with the painting surface and once again I'm, I'm very pleased with how that's turning out it's a rather simple process as you see me paint this and yet I really think it 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 lends itself well to uh, to to a lot of uh, painting processes whether you're painting impressionistically or not and here, uh, noticing again that the, the water line seemed just a little bit slanted or tilted and wanting to go back over that. And uh, realizing that the water further away from me is going to be more blue in comparison to the water that's going to be closer to me. And so... This is kind of a dirty greenish blue that we've got that we just put into Marthasville there. And since this is a wetland, I want to give the impression that there are little patches of water intermixed with these this vegetation and the shoreline of this little... It could be a river, could be a lake, could be a pond... And so you're beginning to see a few of those little details laid in. And you don't do, need a whole lot of those. It just gives you the impression that there's more than meets the eye. And it, it, um, it's amazing what the eye does. It, it sees a few little dots of color and it begins to read it as water in the midst of the vegetation. Same way that it reads uh, just those little lines into the uh, into the colored masses as trees. By the way, if you would like to purchase any of the artwork that you see in my videos, I often uh, sell them on my website. You can go to uh, davidwpoe.com
And sometimes I will sell my studies or lesser works also on eBay. Uh, just type in my name, David Wesley Poe, in the search engine in eBay, and you should come to a page of my paintings that I have for sale. So uh, if you'd be interested in any of that, by all means. Some sell rather quickly, others tend to hang on for a while. Again, I uh, appreciate you watching this video today. If you like this content, uh, please consider giving me a thumbs up after you've completed uh, your viewing. And uh, maybe even put a comment in the comment section. Subscribe to the channel. Oh, what else can you do for me? Gosh, i just giving you lots of homework. Um, you could also even share a, a link on your own Facebook page or Instagram page. Maybe friends and family members that you know who also enjoy painting may find this helpful to them. Now, at this stage in the painting process, I'm, I'm stepping back at some points to see how how these colors are mixing and one of the things i noticed was that i wanted a brighter orange in the in the mix to help with the greens and to play off of the orange of uh, the purples in this painting and so i mixed up a, a brighter orange color and now i'm applying it in various sections of the painting i think you can see that that's different than that salmon color and, and some of the red tones that I had before. So I'm going to be covering up some of that color, the salmon color, with this bright orange. And I do think that makes for a better painting. I, I think it does pop out more and, and give the effect that I was looking for. So, And uh, now I've can, decided that this is pretty much done. I'm taking my... Uh, I don't know what you call that, but it's a rubber instrument with basically a fine point on it. And I carve my name into it as, as my signature. I noticed that that uh, corner was still a little too red. And so it was uh, causing uh, you to go right off of the, right off of the canvas. Uh, it, was, it was catching too much attention. And I want to focus on those groupings of trees, these aspen trees and the darker branches right there. And here's a close-up. I'm going to show you real quickly some of the texture of what these colors look like. Once again, you start with a very thin layer, at least I do, and then build up uh, the subsequent paint layers. And this is all done a la prima, all at once. And uh, I'm not going to be modifying this any. Uh, 